Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 27. We are doing the exercises for section C, which is about parallelism and concurrency. Um, and this exercise just says, uh, read the comments and do what they say. So let's read the comments. In this exercise, we build a basic mutex, a synchronization primitive that guarantees safe access to a piece of shared mutable state. In the implementation, we must guarantee that only one thread can modify the value within the mutex at any one time. So as I was saying in the video, uh, mutex is a special in Rust different from mutex as you might have found in other languages because the mutex contains the thing it's protecting so you can't kind of accidentally access that thing without taking the mutex or something like that uh, this exercise uses unsafe something that we will look at in more detail in a later lecture um, but the kind of summary that they're giving us is just because it says unsafe doesn't mean it's unsafe it just means that you as the programmer have to guarantee some stuff uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of like it could be unsafe unless you follow some rules. Um, background. Uh, if things going wrong in that kind of way is called undefined behavior. Um, so a program might crash or something unpredictable might happen. Um, and yeah, panicking doesn't count as un undefined behavior. Uh, yeah, so normally, if you don't use unsafe, um, no undefined behavior can happen. But um, since we're going to use unsafe, it might. All right, so here is what they want us to do. They've given us uh, the definition of something that they've called mutex. And um, inside it, so it's, it has a type parameter of T, and inside it, it has a cell, which is uh, an unsafe cell containing a T. And it has an atomic ball. So this means a ball that no one else can fiddle with while we're fiddling with it. Um, because it's atomic. So even if there's another thread going on, um, if we're, if, if we're doing an operation on it, like set it and read at the same time, uh, no one else can like set it in the middle of us setting and reading it. That kind of thing. But they might obviously mess around with it when we're not messing around with it. Okay. So what we need to do is implement send for mutex uh, that's interesting so this so that means um, you're allowed to pass it to another thread um, yeah all right so implementing sync is an assertion that um, mutex t is safe to move between threads um, which is equivalent to saying that a reference to a mutex implement send uh, conceptually, a mutex can be used to send a value from one thread to another. If T is not send, can mutex implement sync? Um, well, let's think about that when we've thought about how this how this goes. Right. So, even with a reference to a mutex, we can actually move a value of type T between threads. But moving values of type T. All right. So I think what they're saying is. If um, if we did make mutex of t sync when t is not send, then there would be a way of getting um, this t to appear in a different thread. Because if you've got a reference to a mutex, I think that's what they're saying. All right, so here is how you implement send for a mutex of t. So So what we're saying is, um, if t is send, then mutex of t is sync. That's what this, that's how to read this sentence. And that's, that's it. You don't actually write any code inside here. You just say, um, even though normally if t wasn't sync, mutex of t kind of by default wouldn't be sync because it's, it's, um, mutex of t contains a t because it contains an unsafe cell of t. Um, but we're saying, uh, even if t isn't sync, so long as t is send, let's say that mutex is sync. So a quick refresher on send and sync. Uh, send means you can send this thing to another thread. And sync means um, you can pass a reference to this thing to another thread. So you can use it from two threads simultaneously. So sync is kind of the difficult thing, right? It's, it's the thing that... Um, 
depending what you're doing inside Mutex, needs some clever code, which I guess is what we're going to be implementing in this exercise. All right, so they've also given us this thing called Mutex Guard, which is what we return when we lock. So here's us locking. Um, so when you call lock, we return a mutex guard, and a mutex guard is responsible for unlocking us, which I notice is here. Um, when the mutex guard gets dropped. Okay. So what we, what they're asking us to implement. So it looks like this, and the new is already done. It just creates an unsafe cell and says no one has locked us at the moment. Um, and then this looks like this is implemented for us. So this is a loop. This is called block until you lock. And we get hold of Well, so we're, we're throwing away the return value of swap. So what does swap do? Swap stores the value true, returning the previous value. So we're not throwing it away, we're using it. Yeah, okay, so what it's saying is, um, if we call swap on this, which is going to, so if, if we're already locked, this is going to return true. Um, so while, like, locked is already true, um, that means when, like calling swap on it and swapping in true has no effect on it. So while it, while this thing is, is true, then spin loop, which basically means like, um, do some other work for a second, but then just come back to me. Um, so like, this is like a tight loop. Um, but it gives the operating system, this, this line here basically gives the operating system a chance to do some other work, but then come straight back to me. Um, and stay, like keep on going around this while loop every time locked is still true. But if locked was somehow false, because someone else has unlocked us, then set it to true and stop looping, right? So that's why it says block until you lock. And this ordering acquire, is a style of memory ordering and and I'm not sure I understand exactly what but I assume it's a relatively strict or memory ordering to say um, we couldn't accidentally end up thinking we've acquired the lock when we haven't. So this is basically a way of saying, please acquire the lock. Please make sure that we're the one in charge of um, the thing inside our unsafe cell, because we've set this locked thing to true, because and it was previously false. You know, we know it's previously false because we wouldn't have exited the while loop unless it was previously false. Okay. Um, so they want us to implement lock. They want us to implement into inner. Um, I don't know whether we need to lock until you lock. So I'm assuming lock is going to um, depend on basically calling block until you lock. Um, and then they want us to implement deref, which will give us a reference to a T. No, they've, de they've implemented deref for us. Um, and so they've implemented deref by saying, yes, I know this stuff is in unsafe. But what I want, want to do is get, get the value out of the cell. Oh, this is, sorry, this is implement, this is deref on mutex guard. So if we've got a mutex guard, we know that we've already acquired the lock, I think. Because in order to get a mutex guard, you had to call lock. So now we've got a mutex guard, someone's derefing it. And the way we deref it is to get the thing out of the cell in the mutex. So the, the mutex guard has a reference to the mutex. 
Where was that? Where's Mutex Guard defined? Yeah, Mutex Guard has a reference to our Mutex. So we call get on that and um, dereference it to get out the actual T and then reference it to get a reference to a T. And every time you write an unsafe block, you have to write a safety comment saying, this is why this is safe to do. So here, the safety uh, thing says, safety comment says, we have already, we have a shared reference to the mutex card, right? Because this is, uh, yeah, because th this ampersand self means we have a shared reference to a mutex card. Therefore, we have shared access to the value protected by the mutex. Now, I'm just wondering about why shared access is good enough, and it wouldn't be um, exclusive access that we need here. Um, yeah, I think maybe that's big. That's to do with how cell works and the fact that it lets you. But yeah, that's interesting. Let's think about that. Oh, is it because this is deref and not deref mute? I guess so. And then we've got deref mute saying, yeah, we have exclusive, we have an exclusive reference to Mutex Guard. So we have exclusive access. Yeah, okay. So it's basically here it's saying, um, shared, shared access is good enough because we're only giving out a shared reference to the T. And here we're giving out a, an exclusive reference to Amazon mute reference to the T. But in both cases, this is safe because we have a mutex guard, so uh, no one else ha is holding this lock. Okay, so other things you need to do, implement drop for mutex guard that unlocks the mutex. Um, and the kind of test criteria that we've actually done what we're supposed to do is that the main function should run, it shouldn't crash or anything like that. Um, and then you can get bonus points by using the atomic weight crate to play. Okay. Instead of using the spin loop and we can read the rust atomics and locks book to explain how that works. All right. So let's look at what this main thread main method does. It creates a mutex wrapping this thing called this thing, which is a string containing the word threads. Then it, it creates a load of threads. And each one tries to lock a mutex and then add some numbers to that string, numbers and letters, and prints them. And what should happen at the end is that we print out uh, threads colon and then a load of things, not necessarily in this order. And none of them like crash or something because they've um, they both acquired the lock at the same time. So I guess we could try this out by using... A, a, mute, a normal mutex instead of implementing our own one. So we could probably comment out all of this stuff and instead import a normal mutex and just see how this program runs if we do that. So it doesn't know what a mutex is, so let's bring one in. Um, and, ah, oh, yeah, now it's, uh, and then lock on a normal mutex returns the result, so we need to unwrap it. Oops, we need a dot there, won't we? And then if we, well, we still got an error. Oh yeah, this should be, uh, this also needs an unwrap. Okay, so if we run this, it prints out threads and then all the threads. You notice they're not quite in order. So for thread four happened before thread three, but they're, they're vaguely in order, aren't they? Which is slightly unsatisfying. If we run it again, they might be in a different order. Yeah, they are. Okay, good. Yeah, it really sometimes is out of order. Okay, so um, let's put everything back and let's make sure we're not importing the real mutex. Um, and let's undo all our commenting out. Right, so we're not importing the real mutex. 
We've got some warnings when we run now. Um, it for all fails because we're panicking because we've got a load of to dos in our code. Okay, so we're going to take a break now. But our job is to try and implement mutex so that that main method works properly. Um, and it's going to be some guesswork in here. Um, and I'm not, um, by any means an expert in writing, um, unsafe threaded code. So I may actually do this wrong. Um, but we can see whether we get to the, the main method to the point where it runs correctly. Uh, and then maybe we can find some kind of authoritative source for what the right way to implement this is. So back in a bit. All right, we're back and let's get on with implementing this stuff. So we've got this block until you lock utility and my plan for implementing lock is going to be essentially take the lock, which means updating that boolean locked and then return the guard. I think that's basically it. So take the lock is going to be self.block until you lock. I think it's just that. And then return the guard is going to be greater guard. You take guard. Um, self. Uh, it's going to be mutex colon self, right? Is it that easy? Okay, let's see. All right, so into inner. Um, so how does into inner work? So lock for me is clear. You need to take the lock and return a mutex card. Um, into inner is it's oh okay it's destroying this mutex uh, hence the name into so it gives back a t so i guess we want to say like if someone else has got this mutex locked they've got a reference to t so i think we do need to take the lock I think. So I don't know how we find out whether I'm right or not. But yeah, basically, let's write a comment here. So take the lock. I mean, we could call lock here. But the, the mutex guard we get back is not much use to us. So it's probably fine. But um, to ensure no one else has a reference to uh, T, right? Now we've got the lock. I think there's going to be an unsafe lock here. It's going to be, um, I think that it's called cell. Yeah. So we have this cell. And then we could call, we could call into inner. Like so. So basically, because we want a T, so the, and the cell contains a T, we can call into inner. Uh, and this works. So the question is, why have we not had to make an unsafe block? Maybe we could have just called... Okay, all right, so now let's think. Do we need to take the lock? Now, I think the answer is no. We don't need to take the lock because we are consuming self. And if we're consuming self, that means no one else has a reference to self. Otherwise, the compiler will stop us. And mutex guard has a reference to self. So I think there must be no, no mutex guards. Must, let's write this down. No mutex guards can exist because, um, if, because if they did exist, we, uh, is it, because if they did exist, they would have, a reference to self ref reference to self um, but we have ownership of self something like that so yeah I think that means we don't need to take the lock 
so we don't need to take the lock. Thank goodness for Rust's ownership rules that this just right itself here has that that helpful implication. Okay. Um, it's warning us that unlock's not used, which is fair because we haven't implemented mutex card. So now we have the ability to lock the mutex um, with this spin lock, which just loops and loops and loops until it gets until locked was false and it sets it to true. Uh, we can unlock it again by just setting it to false again. Uh, we could kind of assert that this return value was true. It should be like you shouldn't be able to unlock unless it was. Locked, I imagine. But yeah. Um, and then we can get the T out of this mutex by just uh, taking ownership of this mutex so no one else has reference to it, and then just taking it out. Okay. So, mutex guard, which is the thing which makes sure that we unlock again when we get dropped. So first of all, you use the mutex guard to actually access the T, and this is done for us. We just call get on the cell inside us. But it has to be inside an unsafe block because um, uh, because cell the unsafe cell is unsafe. But we've written this comment explaining why it's okay, and the reason why it's okay is because the, the whole point of the mutex guard is that we have uh, ac access to this thing because we've taken the lock, similar for deref mute. Um, and what we need to do is implement drop. So, import drop for mutex guard. I guess import brackets t drop for mutex guard of t. Is that what, how mutex guard works? So oh, it takes in a, um, a lifetime. So let's just use the anonymous lifetime, see if that works. Like so. Now. We can get the our editor to fill in the. Well, that's gone all wrong, hasn't it? Anyway, oh yeah, that's really gone wrong. Uh, yeah, all right. So uh, we need to implement a drop method, and um, we have a mutex inside us. So is it just going to be self dot mutex dot unlock? Is it that easy? I think it's that easy. All right, should we try running the main function? It works. And look, they do come out in different orders every time. So uh, this implementation of mutex appears to work. I, I need to emphasize uh, as much as I can. I, I guess we didn't write any unsafe blocks. So there's some possibility it's correct. But I need to emphasize again. Um, I have no clue what I'm doing. Um, and this code could easily be wrong. Don't use this to implement a mutex. Um, and we've missed out the two hardest bits, probably, of implementing mutex, which are uh, not spin locking. And I guess the use of this atomic weight crate would be the way you would avoid spin locking. So by spin locking, I mean um, using up your CPU, going round and round and round this loop, uh, waiting until we can get hold of, until we can set locked to true because it was false um, and dealing with panics so if someone panics while they're holding I mean, so if someone owns a mutex guard and that thread panics they'll never call unlock because the drop will never get called um, and that's why so the real mutex does handle this and that's why uh, when we use the real mutex we needed to say unwrap after this lock because the real mutex has a check that some, no one else has panicked while they were holding uh, this lock. And we just haven't bothered implementing that. So those are the two things about writing mutex that um, are difficult, that we haven't done. But also the bit that we have done is probably wrong. So if you'd like to learn how to do this properly, I guess the first place to look would be look at the source code of add the actual mutex in the Rust standard library. Uh, I guess also read the Rust Atomics and Locks book, which um, apparently is really good. Uh, definitely don't copy what I did. Um, but I think that's exercise two done.